Welcome to the Membership Business Growth Podcast, the number one podcast for martial arts and fitness business owners. We'll dive deep with industry legends, industry legends to bring you insider secrets on marketing, sales, retention strategies, and life's balancing act. Get expert tips for business growth right here, right now on the Membership Business Growth Podcast. Let's kickstart the action with your host, Ron Sell. This is Ron Sell, and welcome to the Membership Business Growth Podcast. I'm super excited today because we have Paul Garcia with us. And I'm, I want to tell a, a quick story, Paul, before we start. Uh, okay. I think it was, I can't, it was like 2004 or 2005. I had a real burning question for months and months and months in my business, and I called you up. I don't know if you remember this conversation, but I remember it very detailed. I was okay. sitting on my back porch of my home. And uh, literally for six months, I've been stressing about something that I didn't have the answer to. And I think you spent an hour or two with me on the phone and you solved my problem. And uh, I remember what the problem is now, but I'm not going to get into it. But I was so grateful because I immediately went to work. I took your advice. I worked on it for the next six months and it was totally gone in my business. And, uh, and that really was a lifesaver. So I'm excited to have you here today. That's and uh, we're going to talk about growth. Sounds good. I appreciate you and thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be exciting. We're going to help a lot of people. Yes, sir. We will. Tell me a little bit about first before we start, you know, the talk on growth, but tell me a little bit about where you're located and what your schools are like, that kind of stuff. So, you know, everybody has a an, kind of an idea. Okay. I live in Rhode Island, but my schools are in Massachusetts. So I have four schools, uh, one of them in North Attleboro, Massachusetts, one of them in Franklin, Massachusetts another one in Mansfield, Massachusetts, and then our fourth one is in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Um, the, the active count of the school, our, our main school, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, pre-COVID, we had over 600. We're, we're almost about 600 now. We're fighting our way back. Um, the other schools, the Franklin School has over 400. Mansfield School has about 350, 360. And then our newest school, which is Shrewsbury, has a little over 300. Um, and we just got a terrific team in place. You know, we've got their hearts are in the right place. We all just work really well together. Um, we complement each other as far as our strengths and our weaknesses. And I'm very grateful, very grateful for the team that we have. Yeah, that's incredible. So your the your uh, newest location's got about three ten or something like that. You said. Sir. Sure. Like, how old is that school? Like, when did you start that school? That school is I'm going to say four years old now. Four okay. years. Old. Um, I actually, the, the team there used to work with me, um, but they didn't work for me uh, many years ago. So, you know, there was, when we brought them on, we, are, we were having to really do a lot of retraining as far as, um, you know, they were, they, were, they were taught one way and, and our systems are a little bit different. Our methods are a little bit different. So we just gave them the time and space, the time and space to wrap their heads around it, to feel comfortable with it, to trust us. Um, but I now really think that these guys are operating, these guys, it's a husband and wife team, they're operating on all cylinders and they're killing them up there. Oh man, that's incredible. So you're able to take somebody from another system totally and, you know, train them in your ways and they're crushing it. Sounds like to me. Yeah. Yeah. I think the biggest challenge with, with that scenario is unlike us um, to do that. I just, I've known these people for many years and quite honestly, I just, I just fell in love with them. They're, they're good people. Their heart's in the right place. They wanted to run a successful business. And when we say success, naturally, they want to, they want to take care of their family. They want to take care of their staff, but they also want to have an impact. They want to leave a legacy. They want to do some good for the community. Um, and they were there, but, but when you're trained in one way, naturally, you're going to be a little skeptical about sure. anything. So we had to work on that trust relationship that, they had to find out for sure that my heart's on the right place. And I'm not just saying that it is, but give them time, give them space and uh, give them time to learn the new systems and very, very proud of what they're accomplishing up there. Yeah, yeah. that's incredible. That's really great. Let's talk about, um, and I mean, you've just got a, a great um, a team and I mean, you guys have been, have been doing this for so long and, and been successful for so long. What, what do you think when I, when I say growth in schools, because there's a lot of schools out there that are listening and that are friends of mine and uh you know they they might be stuck at a plateau or they're struggling maybe right now like when when i say growth like what would you say to those guys 
But I think those are, and, and all right, so let's talk to them as friends. Um, yeah, 100%. Let's speak, let's speak plainly to them and honestly and openly to them uh, because these are common struggles. So yes. if, there was, if there was like some just real nuggets that I was going to share and I had a limited time to share it, I would first, there's, there's two points that I would think we would consider. If we're at a plateau, so we've experienced some kind of growth and then we got into a plateau. I mean, the first thing that I would honestly do is look internal. Uh, so we had mentioned briefly comfort zones. You know, mm. it, when I was coming up, one of my mentors shared with me what he called the four watchouts. So these are four things that an owner has to be aware of. Number one is negative thinking. Number two, you know, it's not going to, when I was a consultant for United Professionals, can't tell you how many times we heard that. Oh, it's not going to work in my area. It's not going to work in my area. And it was almost like we're debating with them. I have to prove them wrong in order to prove that I'm right. It's, that's just exhausting. It is. <laughs> it's like, it, it's based on sound principles. It's going to work anywhere. Yes. Uh, but anyways, negative thinking. You know, that's certainly going to affect the growth. Negative people. You get around the wrong people. I've, again, been a consultant in our professionals. I could tell you schools that we, we grew, and then they got around the wrong people, and it sabotaged our schools. So you got negative thinking, negative people, distractions. And, and again, these aren't just ideas. I've literally seen this happen in schools. I've seen very successful schools, and they get distracted. They get onto other things, and it affects their growth. And then the fourth thing is comfort zones. So negative thinking, negative people. Uh, distractions and comfort zones, but yet we have to identify exactly what is a comfort zone. You know, if you look at what Tony Robbins says, we're motivated by one of two things. We're motivated by either pain or pleasure. So I, I, I'm motivated. I was motivated by a little bit of both. I grew up, my family didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of um, luxuries growing up. And then I, I start competing on the Paul Mitchell team and I'm, I'm traveling around the country and I'm meeting these owners that have competition teams, but I'm seeing these guys that are really successful and I'm scratching my head going, you, you, you're, you're successful teaching martial arts. <laughs> you know, my school that I came up with, God love him. He's an amazing instructor, but we were small, you know, we were like 50, 60 students. We're a competition school. So I couldn't wrap around in my head that you could be successful. And thank goodness. And I talk about this. I, I always share this because it was so impactful. My, my dear friend, uh, Cheech Luzzi, he just took me under his wing and he brought me down to his school. And at that time, he's rocking like over 300, 400 students. And it just blew my mind seeing all these people enjoying martial arts and him taking care of his staff, taking care of his family. And I was inspired. I was inspired. So I think I had a little bit of both, a little bit of pain, a little bit of inspiration. Uh, and that really became the motivation in the beginning to get going. And when you get going, just like everybody else, we all have needs, right? We have rent that's got to get paid. You, you know, you had mentioned you got a family that's got to take care of. Like I was working a miserable job. I couldn't wait to get out of it. I couldn't wait to go full time. So we have these needs that are driving us. But here's the question. What happens when those needs are no longer an issue? Right. That's what I find is the plateau. It's no, you're not driven like you were driven. You're not driven like when you first opened your school and you're like, shoot, I have three months to pay my rent. Or I am the quickest business that has ever yeah. opened and closed. We've all been there, right? Yes, sir. Uh, there's your drive, man. You are, you're doing the birthday parties. You're doing the door hangers back in the day. Like, you didn't care because it needed to be done. You would, your motivation came from needs. So what right. happens when those needs are no longer an issue? That's what I find in my experience creates the comfort zone. So if you look at what Zig Ziglar says, right? Tony Robbins says we're motivated by pain and pleasure. Zig Ziglar says, it's motivation that gets you started. It's character that keeps you going. There's, I think that's the crux of the matter. I'm not saying, I'm not insulting, I'm saying you don't have character. What I'm saying is it now gets replaced by a drive to really passionately want to help people. All the bills are paid. I'm making more money. I'm speaking for a school owner. I'm making, I may not be making as much money as X, Y, and Z, but I'm making more than I thought I would make, or I'm making enough, right? Uh, so here I am, flatlined, and now I'm in maintenance mode. And I think that when, when the character side of things kicks in and you start to replace being driven by need, by a sincere desire that you want to help people, you know, you, I, I think martial arts second to church, I think it's the greatest thing anybody can do. Yeah. 
seriously. And it's so good for the body. It's so good for the mind. Why would you not want to help more people? Why would you not want to get out there and inspire more people to be a part of it? So I, I think comfort zones is a big issue that stops people from growing. And, you know, when it comes to that type of um, that type of inspiration, one of the biggest ways to one of the best ways, I should say, to overcome it is just to be around inspiring people. You know, I've had the good fortune. And what does Zig Ziglar say? If you see a turtle on the fence post, you know, that sucker didn't get there by himself. Right. <laughs> right. He got some help. Yeah, we're all turtles. We didn't get to where we're at by ourselves. So there's no way. And I've, I had the good fortune of being around some really, really good people that their hearts are in the right place. They love martial arts. They love people. And they wanted to make a difference in their community. And that just rubs off on you after a while. Attitudes are contagious. So I think being around inspirational people, motivated, driven people, uh, keeps you to be driven in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely it does, brother. Yeah, I mean... Who you hang out with is who you become. So why not hang out with people that are are driven and, and moving forward and are making impacts for yeah. sure. Yeah. What other what so for what I'm getting from you is that the comfort zone, you get to a point where you're like, wow, um, you know, I never even thought I'd get here. You know, I've been working so hard to get here. Now it's time to maybe relax, take it easy, enjoy sure. the fruits of my labor or something like that. And then you stop doing the things that got you where you were. And so therefore you hit that plateau. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you had mentioned, you know, I've been doing this now. I mean, I'm 55. I started martial arts when I was 11. So I've been doing this for 44 years. I opened my first school when I was 20. Mm. I mean, do the math. I've been doing it for 35 years. Uh, and you had asked me what was one of the things that keeps me driven. And this is going to sound silly. Uh, and it, it, it's perfection. Mm. I, our school, we're not perfect. I look at our schools. There's a lot of places to, to improve. Um, we could do this better. We could do that better. We could execute better. We could, and th that, why am I so, you are perfectionist? No. I just think that when we don't execute to our highest capability, it's the students that suffer. You know, it, it's because I think we can do a better job for them. So it's that it's that sheer desire to want to give my students the best possible experience every single time they come to the school. That's my drive in the business. So I, I, I'm careful to uh, I went to a seminar at one time and the guy says the most successful companies, 60 percent of all their inter interaction it was Nick Peterman, by the way, which is a fantastic guy. Um, he says 60 percent of all the inter interaction between upper management and employees is based on gratitude. And I thought, you know, I really took that to heart because a lot of my interaction was always based on, hey, we can do this because I'm driven to get that, make it better. So I try to make all, all my interaction with them just expressing sincerely how grateful I am, how lucky I am, how blessed I am to have them in my lives working together with me. But then the other 40% is coaching and, and, and correcting and seeing like constantly. You look at a professional football team. These guys are professional football players. They've been doing it since they were kids. And what do they do after a game? They watch film. And what do you know, if you watch inside uh, the NFL and HBO, and what do you hear them saying? The, the stuff they've been taught their entire life. Hey, you didn't cut the corner here. You got to move your feet. You got to square your shoulders off. You got to get your head. They know all that stuff. But it's the habit of executing at a high level. That's what wins championships. That's what we want to do at the school. You already know how to do it. It's just, it's just being held accountable and constant coaching. This is how it's going to be done. This is the way we got to be done. That's what drives me right now. So you've taken on, I mean, your role now in your schools is more of a coaching gratitude, helping them along that path. Yeah. And anybody that pops up that our passion becomes their passion and they want to do this for a living. I love that. That's how we got to four schools. We have another one planning to open because now they're, they're, they're saying, hey, I want to do this for a living. Great. What's the... Terrific, because we're going to teach you how to have a really good lifestyle and you're going to do some good in the process. You know, yeah. we're going to do a community and we're going to do a lot of good for this community. It's the complete win-win. So Absolutely. I'm also driven by that. When people come up and they step up, um, it's organically. We're doing what we do. And, and people, as they're trying to search out their own life meaning and what they want to do, uh, they'll many times come to me and say, I think I want to do this for a living. Fantastic. Let's sit down. Let's have a conversation. Let me show you how to do that. And we'll help them get there. Yeah, it's fantastic. So there's um, there's probably some schools owner, owners out there that are not comfortable. They're really uncomfortable right now. You know, maybe they're struggling. 
uh, or maybe they're trying to get, you know, to the level that you're at, like, what are some of, what are some of tips that you have or ideas for them to look at, to be able to, uh, to get out of the, the rut and, 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 and you know, a, go for it. That's a good question. Yeah. And the good news, especially we said, we're talking to friends, the good news, it's not complicated. It's not. It really is not complicated. Um, that's the good news about it. And I'd be happy to share. Again, I believe in reverse engineering. The first thing that I would absolutely do is, is put your passion in check. Make sure that you're passionate about what you're doing. Make sure that you love what you're doing uh, and, and you want to do more of it. Uh, because when the money starts coming and the success starts coming, you're going to need that passion to keep you driving. So it's like reverse engineering, starting from the inside, being around good people. But really, I said it's not complicated. If you go way back to the personal power days, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm 20 years old. I get invited to, if you remember back in the day, ESC, right? Yep. Here all these numbers. It's blowing my mind, right? All these numbers. And I'm like, wow, this is possible. So I decided to take a trip down to Florida because I want to see this guy. I knew him from Connecticut. When I used to compete, he had a tournament. I would compete in his tournament. But now I hear he's in Florida. You know, at the time, he's got over 600 students. I got to go down there. Who doesn't want to go to Florida? My wife and I drive down there <laughs> from, <Massachusetts laughs> from Rhode Island, right? We got no money. Drive down there, stay at a hotel, and I watch these classes, right? And afterwards, I said, I said to him, uh, Master Silva, I said, Tell me one thing I got to do to be successful. This is a point blank. I asked him. He went in his office. He comes out and he hands me personal power tapes. Yeah, right. I have those. Yeah, he goes <laughs> listen. Listen to these tapes. I'll tell you what. That was the pivot and point in my life. Now, let me. I was going to say specifically what. So anyone listening, in those tapes, I learned that if you want to be successful, first and foremost, get a role model. That's what I learned. The second thing I learned, uh, I mean, how long have those tapes came out? And I can still recite yes. this exact formula. To get a role model, number one. Number two, find out what they do. Number three, do exactly the same thing. And then Tony said this, success leaves clues. And Tony also said this, success doesn't discriminate. Now, that was important to me because I was 20 years old. So I had this glitch in my brain that I was too young to be successful because I'm 20. I'm almost like a babysitter. <laughs> you know what I mean, what yeah. parents going to come and bring their kids to me for life skills? And I had this glitch in my head. And Tony said, if you do the same things that successful people do, it doesn't discriminate. You're going to be successful. That's all I needed to hear. I took it upon myself to make that my quest. I went to upstate New York. I modeled schools up there. And when I say I modeled, I mean, the colors of my school, <laughs> you know, back then we had rug, the rug that I used on my floors. I modeled upstate New York. I modeled South Florida. I even went to California and modeled uh, Ernie Reyes. And I watched and I observed and I started to see consistencies. I didn't question. I didn't care. I just wanted to be successful. And it's that easy. It's that easy. Now, I can tell you from experience, being a consultant for however many years I did at United Professionals, most of the battles that you fight are internal. They're, they're holding on to something, right? And I would just simply say to them, you got to be what, like Bruce Lee, right? Bruce Lee, what did he say? Absorb what is useful, reject what is useless. If it's not working, why hold on to it? What is the point of that? So I think it's, it's not really complicated to be successful. And I think today more than ever, when I go back to the days of UP, how we got our clients the information, I, we wrote manuals and we mailed them to you and you had to read these things. And once a month, you got this thing called a cassette tape, which was me on it, talking about different systems. Today, you got this, you got Zoom, you have seminar. I mean, the information is everywhere. So really the question we could ask is, if the information is everywhere and it's so accessible, why aren't there more successful schools? I, I don't think it's the information. It's everywhere. Right? I think that's really the question that someone's going to have to ask themselves. Maybe it's the inspiration. I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right, brother. I think uh, I, I knew nothing of artificial intelligence nine months ago. I thought it was a fad. 
So I spent over 200 hours. I went to two different uh, seminars on AI and I've yep. watched about 200 hours of YouTube videos on AI. I got like really geeky into it. And now I know it, like I know it, right? So the information's out there even for martial arts schools. Right. And the difference may be between those that are using the information and it's actually working for them, I right. think is, you know, repetitions. Like as soon as I learned a little bit about AI, I immediately started using it, trying it, you know, experimenting with it and putting the action in there. So I think a lot of the information that's out there, people need, just need to change their mindset to just like, hey, let's just try this. It might not work. It might yeah. fail, but let's just try it. Let's, let's put the reps in. Do you, do you agree? I, I agree. I absolutely agree. You got to do the work. Right? You can't be successful while doing the work. And you got to trust. Uh, I, I think I have, sometimes I have it to a fault that I just trust people. I, I, I figured that people's intentions are in the right place. So it was a little easier for me when these people that I didn't really know that well and were telling you to do this. Uh, I knew Cheech extremely well. I trusted him. But these other mentors I was mentioning, they would tell you to do this and I would just do it. I was just like, yes, sir. I'm a, I'm a good, I, I'm a good st student. You know, I was like, yes, sir. I'm going to get it done. And the fact that I'm at, let's finish that story. Um, now I'm 22 years old and uh, 22, 23, I think it was 23. And I have 350 students. I have this, I have the second largest school in all of New England at 23 years old. I had cash in a safe that I didn't even make a year. You know what I mean? Now, I'm not trying to dazzle people with money, but it was just ridiculous how quickly it turned around by just, just, just listening and just absorbing and hearing these people speak. So I think, I think and getting a good mentor um, has to come down to you. There's so many out there, but it really comes down to you. Um, I'm a martial artist first and foremost. I love martial arts. I love training. I love being around people that train. I'm a fan of all of it. I was just telling my, my team yesterday, as you know, I used to be on Paul Mitchell. I watch UFC. But I, I'll tell you what. I thoroughly enjoy watching a traditional Okinawan Japanese kung fu form, like a really good one. I love just sitting there and watch because you know how much time has gone into that kata for that person to do it precisely the way you're seeing it. I admire that, and I see a lot of, like, as a metaphor for business, like that's got to be business. It's it's the executing of the details that makes all the difference. So my point is just find find a mentor that works for you. Find a mentor that you that you say I have a lot in common with this person, or this is the where I want to be. This is the type of school that I want to run because they all have different vibes, and um and it's worth it's worth the search because you're you're talking about your legacy, you know, taking care of your family, the impact you're going to have in your community. I would really uh, start there. Yeah, I would agree. I looking back on when my schools, you know, cause I struggled for a long time, just like everybody does at the beginning. Yeah. And uh, I remember when my schools really started taking off like fast was the times where I'd, I'd fly down to South Florida yeah. and, uh, and sit and sit like a parent in uh, my mentor's school and just watch. And I'd watch every detail and I'd take it back and I'd do it and things that didn't work. I'd call them up and say, you know, I saw this, but I don't understand how it works. Yeah. Give me the, give me the details behind it. Then I'd go back and I'd practice, drill, rehearse, keep working on it until I became, you know, just as good. And, uh, I saw some good results there. So finding a mentor is, is so important. Well, and I think you bring a, a good point. It's the Roger Bannister. Like, you know, I came up with a school of 50, 60 students. So it's, I couldn't even, I couldn't even imagine having 300 students. Like that wasn't even in my radar. I you didn't even know it was possible. Right. So it's the Roger Bannister. What happens? He does brace the four minute mile. What happens the following year? Right. So I think it's getting out of their, their comfort zones and going around and being around biz schools because a lot of things happen. One, you start to see it's really possible. You start to see that these people aren't really smarter than you. They're just doing things differently. You know, like Zig Ziglar tells the story of the, the mud in Louisiana and his car got stuck and he had to call a tower and the tow guy comes in. And says, well, you've never been in Louisiana mud before. Let me show you how to get out. And he says, the guy's not smarter than me. He goes, but he has experiences that I just don't have. These people are not smarter than you. I'm, listen, if you're listening to this, I'll get my wife in here. She'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I am not smarter than you. I just have experiences. 
especially borrowed experiences. I've learned from the top people. So their experience has become my experience, which saved me time rather than reinventing this wheel. 100%. You know, they're not smarter. Yeah. I, 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 so many times I'd go into schools that were doing really well and I'm like, man, if he can do it, I certainly can do it. Yeah. Absolutely. If she can do it, I can certainly do it. I, I'll tell you what, that point, one, one more point on that. Yeah. I had a, a guy who runs my school, second largest school in my organization. His school is flatlining. So I was like, he's more successful now than he has ever thought he'd be. And that's a problem. So I brought him down to South Florida to a school. And I had him watch classes. Now, this guy's a phenomenal instructor, like phenomenal. And afterwards, I took him out to lunch. And the thing I love about him is so honest with me. And I love that. And I said, what'd you think of what you saw? And he goes, honestly, sir, I, don't, I didn't really see any difference. I go, really? I said, that's interesting. I go, what'd you think of the classes? He goes, I think my classes are just as good. He goes, maybe even better. Oh, that's interesting. He goes, why is that? I go, because he grosses twice as much as you do. <laughs> and he just looked at me. I go, isn't that interesting? And I think that's when he got it. He got some confidence. Like, you're on the right track. You're doing the right things. The school should be bigger. The school, And, and I think once he got that confidence – that he saw someone that he was like, I can do that. Or that person's not any really better than I am. That's sometimes that's all we need. Like you said, the confidence. Yeah, right on. I also think, um, I, I know Tony Robbins teaches this, T. Harvecker teaches this, but it's the, ther the law of the thermostat. Yes. And that is, you know, we, we get at this, um, <laughs> that's the law of the thermostat. So in my house, if I want it 72 degrees and it's cold outside, then the heater, once it, once it gets above you know, 75, the heater kicks on, pulls me back down to 72 houses normal again. But then when it gets too uh, cold in here, the air conditioner, whatever, you know, you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. But I think a lot of people have that, you know, they have that in them. They're like, you know, I'm only used to grossing this much. I'm mm -hmm. only used to having these, this many students that we help. And once they get a little bit above it, they kind of self-sabotage themselves. And that pulls them back down to where they're more, most comfortable. And once it gets too low, they're flatlining or whatever, and uh, they start kicking in the actions that get them up there. Do you find the same thing? I'll tell you what uh, I do now. I think that's extremely insult insightful on you. Yeah. Um, personal experience, I can tell you that happened to me. But when you were just talking, I was thinking of so many people in my past when I was consultant, seeing that well, we do that with weight, right? We do that with fitness. Um, we we get to a certain weight and we go, whoa, that's not good. <laughs> that, this is not me. <laughs> that is just this... not okay. And yeah. we pull down and we, you know, do what we got to do. We hit the diet and then all of a sudden we get back close to or where we want it to be and we let it all go again. Yeah. You know, and I think that that comes down to the first point of the motivation. Those people are motivated by pain and pleasure. But what happens when those things are gone? You know, that's... what happens when the pain's not yeah. there? What happens on the place? So I, I'll give you two examples of, of what you just said. Um, that actually happened. You just reminded me in my own life. I mentioned I was on Paul Mitchell. I don't know. Did I mention I was on Paul Mitchell? Yeah, a couple of times. Team Paul Mitchell, one of the greatest teams in the entire world in competitions. <laughs> yeah, at 55. <laughs> Products work, man. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, that became an issue for me because I would go to tournaments with my students. And here comes Stingo's students. And Stingo's a fighter. And let's see what his students look like. And I heard overheard that conversation one too many times. And I went back to my school and I was like, all right, we gotta buckle down. We're getting quality's getting too. And as soon as it shifted to protecting my ego, there goes the school. Mm. Yep. And I and that wasn't just me. That also happened to a buddy of mine. Well, he was a client when I worked for United States. I won't say any names. He was killing it, man. He had over 400 students in Boca, Florida. He was killing it. And remember the four watchouts. Got around the wrong people. They started criticizing his curriculum. They started criticizing his methods. He felt like he had to either protect his own ego or at least prove to them. And he changed the things that were working. And there goes the school. Yeah, so self-sabotage, man. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, I, I think again, it, it's it's tough. It, it's tough because we we certainly want to be respected by our peers. Yes, um, you know we we do. But honestly, at the end of the day, I, I'm 
I'm in this for, I'm just going to say it like this. God's my conscience. So if he convicts me, I'm doing something wrong. If he doesn't convict me, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> That's the bottom line. <laughs> right on. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder, you know, how I've, um, how I've dealt with the, the thermostat thing is like, first of all, know that it's coming. Like as soon as you get really comfortable and you're doing really well, realize that you have to sort of reset your thermostat to a whole new level. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so just recognizing that it's going to happen and just resetting it. Okay. We're at, you know, we're at 200 students now. All right. It's comfortable. We're paying our bills. So now what, what's, what's my motivation now? My motivation can't be getting comfortable anymore. It's gotta be, you know, something bigger than us for me. Personally, like Spark, uh, the software the company that I own, like we got big really fast. And you right before you heard it, yeah, yeah. Um, we got big really fast. And my whole motivation at the beginning, we talked about this before, was you know, I needed to feed my kids. That was the first thing. So once we got to the point where I'm feeding my kids, we're doing pretty well, right? Uh, my motivation had to kind of change and my thermostat had to change. And that to me, it was this man, we're helping so many people. Yeah. And we have such good tools for these guys to use. And these uh, studios are then, you know, impacting more lives in their communities because they're not spending so much time on software. Mm -hmm. So my whole mental side says, I wonder how many more people we could help do that same thing. How many more schools can we help make more money and make a greater impact, <laughs> go on vacations, <laughs> you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now my motivation is, is strictly on that. It's like, Man, we we have we have we have a gift that we need to share with a lot more people. And the yeah. same thing can happen in martial arts schools. You know, I mean, you well, can you know for a fact that you're helping people. I mean, you know it, you see it. You see the shy kid become confident. You know, you see the out of shape person get in better shape. You see the stressed out adult, <laughs> you know, lose their stress and enjoy their life again, right? And so why not give that as a gift to as many people as you possibly can? And, and that well, speaking of firsthand as a client, I can tell you exactly what you do for me. I did not open a school to do administrative work. <laughs> right. <laughs> my wheelhouse to teach and to train staff. That Those are the things that I'm good at. So the less time that I can spend doing all of that, the more time I can spend doing what I'm good at. So you're you're helping me help more people because I'm I'm able to stay in my wheelhouse. Right. That's, that's, that's the goal. Yeah. yeah. The other thing that, that you do, you all do well is the communication aspect. I mean, if I can if I can get letters and send them to birthday parties, that's going to help me get a kid, you know, in my school. I know what my program is going to do for them. So you're you're indirectly helping me with my community. Now that it, it's just keeping that vision constantly in the forefront of your brain. And if I could give one other piece of advice is is input. Um, I was working at United Professionals, and I really got into. So I, I had a school in Rhode Island. I had it for four years. I sold it. I went down to Florida. I became a consultant. You know, many of the schools, probably a lot of these people listening, they they were clients of ours. Um, and and all of a sudden, things just started to change. I love consulting. I loved working with owners. Yeah. I started to get a lot of input from 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 Zig Ziglar, and I would start listening to uh, raising positive kids in a negative world. Um, I would listen to. I would read over the top, and I started to realize how much negativity was affecting children and what was the result of that negativity, right? Dr. Joyce Brothers says that your self-esteem, your self-image is tied into you so much. It's ingrained into your, your, your being so much that it chooses everything from your career to your clothing, to your spouse, to, to, I mean, it's affecting you that much. So if it's, if it's negative and I'll tell you what, I got so inspired because I started seeing we could do this through martial arts. Mm. We could help. The, when I first came back to the school, that's why I call it America's Best Defense. I call it America's Best Defense because it's not related to a style. The slogan is America's Best Defense. A true heart, healthy, a strong mind, and healthy body is your best defense. I don't care what style you are. America's Best Defense is to help these people with their self-esteem and their self-image and their confidence. That, that's what we do. So... I got inspired and I said, I'm going to go open a school again because I want to be at the grassroots of doing this. I want to create a curriculum that people want to be a part of because it's fun. But while they're there, 
I'm going to really minister to their minds and their attitudes and their character. And this is when it all started, like the buzzword of life skills. But that just really gripped me. And that that became what I want to be about, what I want our schools to be about. So I think input too, going back to be around the right people, go to the seminar, shake hands, meet these people, uh, read the books that inspire you to want to make a difference. Because it, it's not about success anymore. And what does Zig Ziglar say? What is it? Let me see if I can remember. Your first goal is survival. Then your next goal is success. And then your final goal should be significance. That's what I want to do. 100%. I want want at the end that people go, man, that person made a difference in my life. And I want tens of thousands of people to say that. Not for any ego trip, just to know that your life meant something. Other than, (laughs) you know, the car that I drive that I'm going to probably replace in in a year or two. That's where the real juice is, brother. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, it is fun to drive the nice car, but I'll tell you what, it's way more fun to know that you've helped people lead a better life. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's fuel. Yeah. Yeah. And you just got to, I, it happened to me because I was around it. You know, I was around, I think that's one of the, the challenges that we have these days is because everything's so fragmented. You know, there's so many companies and I'm not saying that there's something wrong with that. That we don't, we don't, back then it was only one, you know, there, there was EFC and everybody went there. Yeah. You networked with everybody, you know. It was and awesome, man. Those days were cool. That's right. You networked. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the movie stars came in and you were like, oh, this already raised you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You were, you were just, and now we're so fragmented that I don't think we're, I can't really say, I don't know. I, I would just say that we may be missing that, that opportunity to be inspired. And be like, I heard that guy speak. That's that's the kind of school I want to run. That I'll tell you, I don't even know if people would even recognize his name. But the first person who ever planted the seed in my brain that martial arts and I, I take that back if you don't recognize his name, because but anyways, he, I was a young kid. I was at a seminar and Will Mayer. Oh yeah. He's there, my friend. Uh, let me tell you, that that man literally changed my life. And then Tom Callis was second behind him, and, and Tom's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Those two spent guys. Some time with him a couple weeks ago in uh, Southern California at those, Roland Osborne's event, Tom Callis. Burned into my brain that martial arts is a metaphor. That, yeah, we're going to teach you how to kick and punch. Yeah, you're going to learn how to defend yourself. But it's a character. It's about character. It's about, and that, when that, that was like, all right, I got it. This is what martial arts is about. And that actually was the seed that was planted on my brain that became literally my life's mission. You know, it, it, that martial arts is more than just kicking and punching. You know, this, um, all of the, there's a lot of insights that we just talked about that you just shared with us. I mean, there's a lot of things hidden in between the layers of what you said, but I, what I hope is people hear your character and, and your purpose and your why and, and, you know, what motivates you, because I think that's why you have four schools that the smallest schools got only 310 members in it. And the, the biggest ones got close to 600. That's why. I mean, your character and the way that you're, that you're teaching and all that stuff is, is the reason why, you know, success is attracted to you. And I still teach. I still run classes. And, and uh, you know, I heard, a, I heard a guy say this and I go, I don't even know what that means. Well, I can tell you what it means now. <laughs> One of my mentors used to say, I asked, I said, you still teach? He goes, yeah, I teach by choice. He just said it just like that. I teach by choice. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. Here's what it means. I don't have to teach. I have plenty of staff, plenty of staff that run great dojos. You can't get me off that floor. <laughs> you know what I mean? I teach appropriately. Like I know there's certain classes. They don't want to be taught by me. I'm the old guy. <laughs> you know what I mean, they're teenagers. They want to be taught by my younger staff. I got it. But there's certain classes that I know that I can make an impact and I know I'm like, and I love it. I love being there. I love being there with them. I love interacting with them. I love meeting the parents, talking to the parents. I love teaching, you know, adults that are just getting started and showing them basic stuff and they get all excited. It, it's, I like being around people. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that that passion is, is what's driving a lot of the success. And thankfully my, my team is the same way. And what I'm saying is it's not unique. I think that's the takeaway. I don't want anyone to walk away from this, but that's good for him. This is stuff that's rubbed off on me. This is stuff that I've learned from others. And and I think it's designed that way. You know, you hear the talk that we're tribal. I always say we're community. 
Uh, we, we're meant to be in a community. We're meant to engage with one another. We're meant to do these things. So hopefully they'll reach out and they'll get connected. God knows there's plenty of opportunities. I mean, my Facebook feeds is constantly getting this seminar, that seminar. <laughs> Just go get connected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right on, brother. Yeah, we're going to have an event here in Tampa, uh, April 19th, 20th, 21st. Um, we're, I don't know if you knew this or not, but we're building uh, headquarters here in Tampa. 5,000 square feet. It's going to house my my staff, but we have out of the 5,000 feet, we have 1,400 feet of classroom space. So we're going to have tables in there. So people can bring their laptops and we're going to train them on, you know, how do you, how do you build a better business? How do you build a better life? How do you use spark better? And, uh, and also of course, fellowship and, and hanging out with, uh, with cool people. So there you go. That That's what's needed. That's what's needed today. Yeah. hundred percent. And I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you doing this and, trying to reach out. You can tell what your passion is. You're just trying to help these people go. It probably breaks your heart when you hear people call on you and whatever, they can't pay their bills or they're frustrated and you know, they, they, they want to give up and, and it breaks your heart. Cause you're like, you want to give up. Do you realize how much good we're doing? You know, but they're not tasting that. So how do we get through them so that they can, because again, I'm going to keep going back to it. It has nothing to do with intelligence. <laughs> it really doesn't. <laughs> it just has to do with drive and having the right information. And belief, belief that it can be done. Belief yeah. that you are the one that can do it. it. Well, you know, so I have, I have much like probably a lot of you guys, I have tattoos on my arms. And I don't know if you can see this. So I have Hebrew tattoos on my arms. Okay. And the reason I mentioned, this is the reason I mentioned, not to show off my tattoos. Uh, when I go down to South Florida, I have a condo down there and I go down there often. And I often forget that there's a lot of Jewish people in South Florida. <laughs> So I'll inevitably be in a grocery store and I'll, this happens all the time. Ask any friends that come with me and I will reach up and grab somebody and they'll see it and they'll come up and go, can I read that? And I go, sure, of course you can. And they'll start reading it and they'll look at me and they go, hello. I go, yeah, it's hello. And what reason why I say this, if you want to end here, this is, a group, is what it basically says. It's a very famous poem by him that essentially just says, if not now, when? If not you, who? Who's going to do it? Who's going to forget what people are going to say that, you know, you're not going to meet their expectations. You're not going to do it as good as they do it. Someone else does it better than you. Forget all of that. Your neighbor doesn't care about that. The kid who got bullied doesn't care about that. The girl who's got a low self-esteem, doesn't know what true confidence is or where it comes from, doesn't care about that. Who's going to do it? You're there in that town. That's how, that's how I look at it. That's uh, this has been great, buddy. Thank you so much for uh, taking your time and, and speaking into the lives of others. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah. No, well, Love well, you, and, man. And with one last thing, one of my mentors used to say this, go. Yeah. You know what that means? <laughs> yes. I you think I do. <laughs> so get it, guys. We're here to help. Anything you can do, count me in. I'm here to help. Uh, that sounds great, man. Yeah, you know, massive action produces massive results. There's a yeah. lot of people out there that will tell you differently. They will tell you that, you know, you don't have to work as hard. You don't have to push. You don't have to have that drive. But I've never, you know, this is like my 18th business that I've launched uh, in Spark. And uh, I've never once had a business become successful without getting off my ass and right. taking massive action every day. Now, okay. not it doesn't have to be that way all the time. But for the first few years, man, you got you better start running. Well, if that was true, that you don't have to work to produce, you might as well take the book of Proverbs and rip it out of the Bible. Because that tells you that if you don't work, you're not going to eat. <laughs> it's the that. truth. That's the absolute <laughs> truth. That's for sure. Well, thank you, brother. You've been amazing. And you really shared a lot from your heart. And I love it. Hey, man, I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Always enjoy spending time with you. Love you, yes, sir. Well, you're down in South Florida soon, man. We got to get together. We're going to make yeah. it a point to do that. I'm going down soon. Yes, sir. And if you're ever in Tampa or up this way, man, you got to stop by. We'd love to. Thank you. Yeah. All Keep right. Ready. Good deal. All Take right. Care. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Membership Business Growth Podcast. We hope you take what you learned and use it to propel your business to new heights. For more information, episodes, show notes, and to get social, hit us at membershipbusinessgrowth.com. Membershipbusinessgrowth.com.
If you want to go deeper or send us comments, you can email ron at sparkmembership.com. We'll see you next week for another episode of the Membership Business Growth Podcast with Ron Sell. Thanks again for listening.